Hi, everyone. Well, here we are at the very end of the lecture series. You'll see if you look here that we are at number 16, which completes this whole trajectory. It is, of course, covering 5,000 years of Western literature, starting down here in Mesopotamia with the Epic of Gilgamesh and moving up to today, which will be Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which is just 60 years ago. It's also the case that we moved from out of Northern Africa, jumped the Mediterranean through Europe into England, and then jumped the Atlantic as to, to North America where we are today. So without further ado, let's complete Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And let's start that with a quote by Carson. Whoops, we're not doing eye clicker today. If facts are the seeds that later produce knowledge and wisdom, then the emotions are the impressions of the senses that are the fertile soil in which the seeds must grow. So facts are incredibly important, but by themselves aren't enough. You need to, to put those in the soil of the emotions and impressions of the senses. So what does she mean by that? Well, you know, if you just know a fact, it's true and maybe knowledge and all, but you know, you may not want to act on it. So you hear something about DDT, that's not sufficient. You need the emotions to be checked in. And once that happens, then those facts will will grow because the emotions will foster will, you know, foster change, will get you to want to do something about them. And that really sums up Carson's approach here quite well. She wants you to become emotionally invested. Just having the knowledge about GDT is not enough. You have to care. You have to care about the planet. You have to care about, you know, the beings in it, human and, and otherwise. So, so it's a great quote that, again, nicely sums her up. So Silent Spring and Biosigns. Whoops. And we're again not doing an eye clicker today. Uh, <clears throat> so throw is different from Carson. Thoreau suggested radical lifestyle changes and, and really radical, right? Moving out to Walden Pond, that's that's a big deal. But Thoreau, but Carson is different. Um, she knows that, you know, most people aren't going to go along with something like that. But so what she's then doing is drawing attention to widespread DDT use with the idea that we could change that. So let's actually unpack this a little further. So Thoreau, let's say, um, you know, is, is a personal lifestyle change going to make much difference with something like the chronic climate crisis? And the answer to that is no. So you might, you know, bike everywhere and stay, instead of taking your car, you might, you know, eliminate eating meat from your diet. That's all great, but that's not going to perceptibly move the needle even a little bit. You're just one of 8 billion people. If you want to move the needle, you need collective action. And that's what Carson is proposing. Thoreau, just his individual action, maybe he would encourage some people to do the same. But Carson is suggesting that we need to get together and act and to change these things, to get together and act and cause DDT to be banned in the United States. It would within a decade of her publishing this book because she is able to enlist other people to try to stop that thing from happening, DDT. So you could see the same, you know, uh, you know, not riding, uh, not riding in a car, that's a good thing. But, you know, encouraging the building of bicycle infrastructure, making cars more expensive because of a carbon tax on gasoline, all those things would be good things that you can't really do yourself. But if enough people get together, sure, they could change infrastructure. And you might think, well, yeah, but could that really make a difference? But look, in, in Copenhagen, it took five decades to do, but that um, city was very much dedicated to car use in the 1960s. But bicycle activists collecting together through collective action were able to have the infrastructure changed, cars made less important, bicycles made more important. So right now, two out of three people either um, bike to work or uh, school by way of you know, get to school, commute uh, to school and work by way of bicycles, which is altogether extraordinary. Again, that single person riding a bike doesn't do that. Collective action does. That's what Carson is suggesting. It's different from Thoreau. And it did work, you know. Um, she she may not seem as as hardcore as Thoreau. She's not living out in a you know park like area, but on the other hand, her approach 
even though it doesn't necessarily require any lifestyle changes, can have profound impact. And it did in that, you know, the EPA was formed in 1970 in part because of the publication of Silent Spring. So collective action is is where it's at here. And it it's interesting because you you think you should be, you know, just doing these things yourselves and you should, and you should stop spraying DDT, for example, on your property. But again, with the same as the bicycle example, if you stop spraying DDT on your, your property and your, your garden and all, that's good, but that's that's not going to change DDT being used in the world. That has to happen through collective action. Although, this is a great example, one person like Rachel Carson can get that going. Someone like Greta Thunberg was really great at getting the um, youth environmental, youth climate movement going in the uh, second decade of the 21st century. So you, you definitely should do something, but you, ha you just can't do this by yourself. And Carson is so aware of that. Another difference between Thoreau and Carson is that Thoreau, of course, didn't attack any environmental issues of his day. I mentioned, you know, when we did Thoreau that, you know, he was um, writing during the, sort of the, the peak, in some sense, of the early Industrial Revolution. It was very close to him at Lowell, Massachusetts. He doesn't address it at all. Instead, he's sort of in a very pastoral mode, looking away from the problem, looking toward wilderness as, you know, the the answer. But but it's not at the answer. Someone like Rachel Carson is going to squarely look at the problem. She's going to see that there are problems. She's not going to run away into some, you know, park-like setting. She's not going to wax poetically about a park-like setting. She's going to address the problem directly. It's 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 a very different approach from Thoreau. And here is the problem. So this is DDT being used in the 1950s. These two pictures, this one on the right and this on the left, this one on the right, um, interesting because they're both the same, children being sprayed for DDT. What was happening here? Well, if children had lice, head lice, they spray the um, insecticide, the biocide directly on their heads, which is you know horrific when you realize this is a poison, something that was developed as a, a chemical warfare in the 1940s during the Second World War. And some what's even more just some sense even more disturbing than the children are these people here. So this is a medical care professional spraying it on a child. So the child might just get one exposure to it, but this person is doing it day in and day out. It's being used in a variety of different places. So this is the cabin of an airplane at the time. You may know that you're not supposed to bring things like fruit and vegetable from country to country or even state to state because you can bring you know, pathogens and uh, um, insects with it. But here was the idea. You spray DDT in the cabin, you would kill any insect in the cabin. In some ways, even more worrisome is this picture on the lower right, which is the widespread spraying of DDT in communities, which was done by trucks. You see, it makes this sort of um, cloud of fog in the back. Really disturbing is that children would run out and play in that fog. It was a thing. But I, I think most disturbing of all, of course, is this picture from the up on the lower left. <clears throat> that is an airplane, a crop duster spraying DDT over a whole rain, a whole area. That's the way that this worked. It was spread over whole counties, whole regions of the United States to kill insects. But of course, it's killing all insects where it's landing. It's, it's enormously disturbing um, how widespread it was used. So Sun and Spring and Ecology. So Carson's approach focuses on ecology, and this is how, you know, for each of us, as for the robin in Michigan or the salmon in the, uh, Miramichi, this is a problem of ecology, of interrelationships, of interdependence. We poison the caddis fly in the stream, and the salmon runs, dwindle, and die. We spray our elms in following spring, are silent of robin song, not because we sprayed the robins directly or because, you know, but because the poison traveled step by step through the now familiar elm, leaf, earthworm, robin cycle. These have matter, are matters of fact, uh, record observable, part of the visible world around us. They reflect the web of life or death that scientists called ecology. I think more than anyone else, Rachel Carson is responsible for bringing the notion of ecology to the American public. 
Um, I'll talk about this in, in, in a slide or two, but just to give you a basic idea, you know, um, Ernst Hegel introduced the idea of ecology a hundred years before, but it was mainly scientists that knew about it. The general public really didn't know what ecology was until this book appeared. And how does this work? Well, this now familiar elm leaf earthworm robin cycle. What's that about? <clears throat> you spray DDT on a plant, on a tree, an elm tree. You spray it on there, like with those crop dusters, spraying a whole forest. The DDT is absorbed into the leaf, uh, the elm leaf itself. In the fall, all the leaves fall from an elm tree onto the ground and they start decaying. What helps them decay? Well, earthworms are a prime thing. Earthworms are working on those leaves, eating them, decaying them, turning them into rich soil again, which is terrific. That's part of how ecology works. The problem is the earthworm is ingesting and keeping that DDT in its body. Then robins, birds, come down, grab the earthworm, and eat it. Now, all that concentrated DDT that the earthworm has accumulated from, um, from eating the leaves is now in the robin's body. And the reason for this is everything's related. The elm tree, the earthworm, the robin. Those are three examples, but everything is related everything is going to be impacted by it if a predator eats the robin then that predator now has the ddt in its body because everything is interconnected here that's the issue uh, carson also talks about our own ecology there is also an ecology of the world within our bodies in this unseen world minute causes produce might effects to discover the agents of disease and death depends on a patient piecing together the piecing together of many seemingly distinct and unrelated facts so carson is really ahead of the uh, curve here in realizing that the body is you know involved in an ecosystem too so if we eat food um you know we're not eating robins or earthworms but if we eat things that are grown so if that crop duster sprayed um, the field, then, you know, those plants growing there that we eat, you know what they would be, that could cause a problem. Or if it's, you know, it sprays a, a field that's um, of grass that then, you know, cows graze upon, then we eat the DDT, not directly from the leaves, but through the body of the, the cow. Um, and that and Carson's really ahead of the curve because, you know, we now know that we have the, these extensive biomes all around us and in us. So we have a gut biome, we have a biome on our skin, which means that, you know, you think that all the cells in your body are your body, but we now know that like 10 times as many of the cells that constitute your body are other things, other uh, um, life forms that are in us actually working for our benefit. If we didn't, we wouldn't be able to eat food the way we do, our skin would dry out on the all without those biomes to take it. So Carson just wants to make, make us aware that ecology is not only out there in the world, but in us as well. We're, we're intimately enmeshed in it. But she really is responsible, Rachel Carson, for putting the word out there. And the word is ecology, the interrelationship of life. Again, most people didn't know about it before Rachel Carson. And it's curious and unfortunate, I suppose, that this is how the public became aware of it. So we didn't just hear about how wonderful ecology is because all life is created, is, is working together in this vast, amazing, breathtaking, breathtakingly beautiful system of interconnection in the world. Unfortunately, that's not what we learned, how we learned of it, or the American public learned of it. We learned of it because of it being disrupted. So ecology comes on the scene when ecology is, is breaking down, when ecosystems are breaking down because of this introduced um, thing, which is DDT. And it's just sad, but most, uh, it's, it's sort of like environmental uh, consciousness, as we've described in this class, that People didn't know really about, you know, how beautiful the, the uh, didn't know about the ecosystem of Santa Barbara coast until that oil spill happened in 69. Well, we didn't really understand the beauty of, of the system until it was uh, attacked by DDT. Um, Carson, Carson does a really good job of making clear that it can be tiny little things that can cause major disruption for a long period of time. Um, 
and you know she focuses on something very tiny an insect and how insects which are the the focus of this biocide which is why they're marketed as insecticides how they can be an issue another example i, I mentioned mercury and salmon but mercury and, and tuna is probably a better example so you may know that when you dump things down a drain ultimately that often gets out into the ocean and one of the things that's dumped into the ocean from human um you know uh, businesses uh, and processes the things that we do is mercury mercury is a very very powerful poison and the problem is it gets into the ocean and small fish small animals will eat it it gets absorbed into seaweed and elsewhere and then that cycle begins a small fish eats it a larger fish eats that until a very large fish like a set like a tuna eats that fish and each time the mercury and this is something about how the way mercury works and the body works it doesn't leave the body of each fish so they take it in and it's not like they excrete it out it's still in their body so it's being accumulated in a very large fish like a tuna like that and that's bad news for the tuna and bad news for you if you eat tuna uh, that's why and i'm not sure you might want to look this up but i think the um the most recent recommendation is you only eat seafood like twice a week i could be wrong on that check it uh, but the reason for that is because of things like mercury and accumulated in if not if, you know if this were before these industrial operations a few hundred years ago we could probably eat all the fish you want unfortunate um one of the problems here is that ecosystems are so incredibly complex that you just don't know what's going to impact what, you know, so you introduce something like DDT, the consequences may start small, but they could be really large. And it's, it's curious, I think, that just a few years, maybe four years, three years before uh, Rachel Carson published Silent Spring, that Edward Lorenz, who's one of the originators of modern chaos theory, argued that he was focusing on weather and he realized right away even though computers were coming on the scene to try to predict weather that they would never quite work because the systems these ecosystems are so complicated and in terms of weather he made the famous statement that a butterfly flapping its wings in brazil will eventually maybe a couple of weeks later impact the weather in the u.s why because everything is related those those little flaps of um, the butterfly's wings will ultimately change the local environment there a little which will change something else and something else will change again and ultimately it, it will be felt and you might think well this would be kind of inconsequential why would that matter well there are a lot of butterflies in the world and there are a lot of things happening and when computers try to model all that and now some of the most powerful computers in the world are still in the business of trying to figure out what their weather will be in a week or two and as you may know yeah they're pretty good at, at, at predicting the weather in a, in a day or two but after a week or two it falls it just breaks down and no one's going to even try to you know to publish their prediction of weather a month from now because there are just too many things in play and Carson was drawing attention to that that there are just too many things in play with something like um, the environment so reception how was this book silent spring received by the public um well first off it was incredibly well um, disseminated so not only did the book go on sale and become a national bestseller but it was serialized in the new yorker in its entirety and so you may know the new yorker is a very popular magazine among certain folks and so if you subscribe to it you know every um you know so often you get it delivered to you in the mail and you know every time you'd get a new edition of it there'd be another chapter of silent spring which you could just read through it was similarly excerpted excerpted in audubon magazine and there's something at the time called the book of the month club maybe it's still around but it was very popular so you pay a certain amount every month and every month they send you a new national bestseller and you get it like at a reduced cost if you do this and it was picked up by that as well it was so popular and so well disseminated that even before it was published like a month before what happened was um, during a news conference the then president of the united states jfk was asked what he thought about the book even before it was published because everyone knew what it was what it was going to say and um, to his credit he said you know they're they're looking into it this was obviously something very important that carson was working on and they wanted to to see what they could do about it as you might imagine, 
the chemical industry, which is attacked by Carson in the book, responded by fighting back. Um, even before it was published, because they knew it was a, you know going to be a bombshell, the chemical company that made DDT threatened legal action against the publisher of Silent Spring, publishing the book against New Yorker, Audubon magazine, and uh, to the credit of all them, uh, they didn't they didn't budge and they published it anyhow. But that attack continues today. So these industries that are making money off of things like um, in this case, DDT, or, you know, the fossil fuel industry, they're, they're not, they're not taking this lying down, as you, as we've seen in the class in the documentary we watch, Merchants of Doubt, they are fighting back in a big way. Um, and the argument that they, they came up with was that the, um, something like DDT did more good than it did harm. Okay, even accepting the fact that maybe it, you know, impacts some, you know, insects, more than insects, birds and all, wasn't that worth it? Because, for example, if used in other parts of the world where malaria is a big problem, you know, you could you could save millions of lives by using DDT of human lives. Okay, you're going to lose some bird lives in there. But the argument made by these chemical companies was that's worth it. We, you know, we should care mostly about human beings and human beings, you know, the lives of human beings to this way of thinking outweigh the lives of, of other beings. So, uh, but there was a um, uh, slide, wrong slide on Iraq. But, you know, just going back to this and, and fleshing this out a little further with Iraq, um, this is the argument that, you know, you get from, from the Epic of Gilgamesh, too. We've seen that, right? So, in other words, Gilgamesh said, basically, to his people, you know, we will cut down this forest. Maybe there's harm being done there. That's why that god, um, demigod, you know, Hababa was there to protect it. But look at how it's going to benefit the city. I mean, this forest is going to mean that Iraq will, will indisputably be the greatest city ever created in the West. It'll, you know, it's, it's worth it. And that's the argument here. You weigh it out. Is the damage to the environment, the clear cutting the forest, uh, the collateral damage of, you know, birds and other animals uh, dying, is that worth it when human interests are at stake? And the answer given in, um, in Gilgamesh is absolutely. That's what the, the epic is about. And the um, companies involved in this were, you know, answering in basically the same exact way. So, Silent Spring. Let's go through our last uh, slides here. This is not a debate that is now over. It, it fiercely continues today. So, let me give you a quote here. And this is by Dick Tavern, who is a British politician writing in 1905. And he essentially compares uh, Rachel Carson to Adolf Hitler. So, let's see what he's doing here. This is uh, Tavern. Carson didn't seem to take into account the vital role that it, DDT, played in controlling the transmission of malaria by killing the mosquitoes that carry the parasite. It is the single most effective agent ever developed for saving human life. Rachel Carson was a warning to us all of the dangers of neglecting the evidence-based approach and the need to weigh potential risk against benefit. It can be argued that the anti-DDT campaign she inspired was responsible for almost as many deaths as some of the worst dictators of the last century. So those dictators would be 20th century, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, the Khmer Rouge. And the notion is that Rachel Carson is, is that despicable because she allowed, you know, um, millions of people to die, principally children, because she didn't uh, allow DD, you know, she fought against DDT. And by the way, just as a kind of a, an aside here, DD, DDT was banned in the U.S. in 19, early 1970s, but it's still used worldwide. And the chemical companies that make it still make a fortune because it's used worldwide, principally um, as an ins so-called insecticide, um, focusing on uh, insects like mosquitoes that carry malaria. 
the problem is the the argument here is is basically specious because it's suggesting that there's no other way of controlling those insect populations other than DDT. In fact, in chapter 17 of, of Silent Spring, Rachel Carson makes the argument that we should attempt to genetically modify those insects to solve it. So it wouldn't be solved chemically, but biologically. Um, but there are even much simpler ways of um, of solving it, like mosquito netting. So the principal problem with malaria is that it impacts children. I mean, everyone gets bitten by mosquitoes. Everyone can contract malaria, but infants especially, the mortality rate goes way up. So a simple solution is to put netting over an insect's crib at night so the mosquitoes can't, can't uh, get through to bite the child. There are lots of other alternatives, and Tavern here isn't acknowledging any of them, saying that just DDT is the way to go, and, and not even acknowledging that you know more research needed to be done to find uh, more benign chemicals, for example. But again, lots of alternatives. Uh, but this does continue today. So this guy, Glatz, is speaking for an agency of the Department of Health and actually puts a, bit, a number on it. The ban on DDT may have killed 20 million children worldwide. And again, this raises that debate from Gilgamesh, you know, is the benefit to human beings worth it? Gilgamesh thought it clearly. Who cares about the forest? Look what it would do for people. And the argument here is, you know, who cares about a few birds as collateral damage? Look what this could do. It could save 20 million children. Again, you know, the argument could be made, you know, um, I mean, this is the arguments made, but they're there are other things that you can do. I mean, mosquitoes in particular, they, they, you know, they they grow in sort of very, you know, wetlands and all. So not just wetlands, but if you if you have like standing water near where you live, if you just, you know, put your, um, if you don't have good sanitation, if you know water goes out onto the um, to the ground nearby, mosquitoes are going to breed. You can clear that up. There are all sorts of ways you can address the problem, but um, this is really. Yes, an attack on Rachel Carson, yeah, but it's an attack on the environmental movement in general. And that's been brewing ever since Carson's been around. So, you know, Rachel Carson may seem in some ways like the patron saint of modern environmentalism. She's really the person that gets it going, probably more than anyone else. But on the other hand, Rachel Carson um, is attacked a lot because environmentalism attacked. And um, that was probably most clear in the 2016 presidential campaign when the group that the organization um, that Rachel Carson helped spawn, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which is designed not only to protect people, the environment and all, but people too. I mean, if you have a chemical plant, you know, upriver from where you live, you don't want them to be dropping chemicals in the river. Who protects you there? Well, the EPA does. But in 2016, Donald Trump, as one of his campaign promises, said that he was going to destroy the EPA, that he was going to put it out of existence. He didn't, but he did significantly try to um, to cut back on what the EPA could do. And famously, for example, he um, put pressure on the EPA so that there was no mention of climate change, for example, on the EPA landing page or throughout the EPA was cut back dramatically. So still debate it. Silent Spring is in many ways the work of a genus Loki. So who was there to protect the cedar forest from Gilgamesh Wilhelm Baba, the genus Loki? He was defeated. Um, but now, you know, we've had ever since Amelia Lanier sort of dropped in a big way the notion that we should be stewards of the planet, that we should be a genus Loki, a protector of place. You know, the, the women at the, um, you know, the Kokum estate were there to protect it. They were genus Loki in her mind. Um, so now we have the new genus Loki coming out of that thinking, Lanyard's thinking, um, with environmentalists. You know, so there's a big uh, there's a big effort. For example, has been for many decades now to go into Alaska and into beautiful un, um, um, sort of changed for for many thousands of years wilderness and forest, and you know cut it down so we can get in there to dig out to draw out oil and cause enormous environmental devastation. 
who's going to protect that forest? Well, there's no genus locator like Kumbaba, but there are environmentalists who've been tirely working for decades to stop that. And when Joe Biden said that he was going to authorize that uh, through the Willow Project, it was environmentalists who, who came out, uh, you know, and, and protesting it and arguing strongly against it. And hey, it worked. Um, they defeated Joe Biden. So if there was an epic battle between Joe Biden and the environmentalists over the um, the Willow Project, uh, Biden lost, not like uh, Gilgamesh who won. Of course, Biden has has been been has a pretty good environmental record, but as this makes clear, it's not a terrific one. Even, but it is important that he he listens to reason, and he did in that case. Um, yeah, so it's it's come full circle then, right? So the the in the language of Gilgamesh. Humbaba is a monster, is this horrible thing that has to be defeated, and the hero is this Gilgamesh, who's who's out for human interests. But now it's it's changed. The new genus Loki are fighting the habit of killing, of destroying, of cutting down trees and all. Um, and that's what environmentalism is. Yeah, um, you can see it with someone like Al Gore, Pope Francis. The idea has now come full circle. So it's the planet itself which is being protected, not just a specific locale. So in Amelia Lanyard's description of Cookham, it's just that one state that that group of women are protecting. But now it's the whole planet. And you can do that, of course, by acting, you know, carefully locally as well. Um, and, and that's important here. So it's it's not, I mean, you can protect something. Um, if you protect a forest, for example, today, it can be a very local thing, it can be a small forest, but that will have that will have impact on the planetary level because that forest will help, you know, remove CO2 from the atmosphere and sequester it. And if you cut it down and, and you know, burn it and all, then that CO2 will go right back in the atmosphere. So a local thing can have, can have global consequences and it can be super local, right? So the way you... You, where your body interacts with the, the planet. So if you if you eat beef and meat and all, then your body is going to be producing uh, ultimately more greenhouse gases indirectly because it you know the the cows had to um, the cows produced methane. So you can from the most minute local level you can act globally, but we, we need to do it now. And I think. Most environmentalists, even if they're dealing with like point source pollution, are aware that they also have to act in a way that is consistent with the uh, the betterment of the planet itself. Interestingly, I think environmentalists are less likely to look to the past now than the future. So Thoreau is an example of that. Thoreau's way of living at Walden Pond was kind of a throwback, right? He was living this very simple existence, and he wasn't really looking toward the future. And he didn't address environmental issues at all, right? He lived at Walden Pond, and he turned away from the growth of technological modernity and the Industrial Revolution in his era to try to live something simpler. Um, Rachel Carson and Gore and the bunch are all looking um, not only squarely at those problems, but at the future that they will create. We're thinking very hard about the future. So you may know that when the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, talks about um, you know the problem, they talk about it today, but they also talk a lot about the future. What it's going to be happening in 2050, what will happen in the year 2100. And they have a, a good idea from the computer modeling. And furthermore, they talk about what we need to do in the immediate future, what we need to do by 2030, which is reduce global greenhouse gas emissions in half. If we are to, um, to stop this from getting out of hand, from being beyond two degrees Celsius of temperature rise. But again, it's not looking back at the past. It's not looking back at like a, a perfect locus aminus in the distant past, like Eden or the gold golden age is looking forward and what we can do now to impact the future. Yep. Sun and Spring in, in this sense also addresses one of the, the core questions of this course, one of the opening questions. Why approach environmental issues from a literary perspective? Well, on the one hand, you know, a non-scientific writer and um, Rachel Carson is a good example. Bill McKibben's another example. They're in a great position to disseminate this information to a broad audience because they see how things have emerged over time. But it's also the case that, you know, what we've what I said in the, the first lecture and, and now 
I hope that you can see, is that in looking at past texts, we can understand the emergence of ideas. And ideas are very important because they're still alive and well in the world today. The idea that we should weigh out, you know, human benefits against the benefits to the other life on the planet is still alive and well. And as we just saw a few slides ago, there are people today who still believe firmly that, you know, human interests have to always win. But other people like Carson make the, the argument, which those folks don't really pay attention to is that will ultimately benefit impact us as well if we do damage to the environment it may only it may kill other things right away but will come back to us eventually and the example of mercury and tuna is is a good one you can think that you know we can just discard our problem throw it out in the oceans the oceans are so huge it won't make a difference at all and yet it is impacting our food system and that we you know we 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 can't eat these animals the way we could before and there are lots of examples like this so anyhow that then completes the course so uh, i hope that you uh, benefited maybe even enjoyed by it enjoyed it um, of course there is lecture 17 which we won't be doing in 2023 but i encourage you to um, to look at if you're curious you know what would an alternative be. There are other cultures across the planet historically, and many traditional indigenous cultures. They're absolutely wonderful to look at. But Buddhism is interesting because it, it makes such an interesting counterpoint to Western culture. And further, it's it's still hugely influential in the world today. Unfortunately, because of that concern Lin White Jr. had, you know, Western culture has eradicated a lot of indigenous um, cultures. But Buddhism is still um, surviving uh, quite well, actually. Okay, so that's it. That's the end of the lecture series and the end of the course. Okay, take care.